My name is Lucas Mann, and I pastor the Spring Church here in Lawrence, South Carolina, and I'm out here this morning, or actually this afternoon, uh, to bring the gospel of grace, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, to you as you pump your gas and as you go about your daily activities. Uh, I plead, I come out here to plead with you uh, out of a care for your soul to, to repent and believe the gospel, to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, friends, I, I come out here to make known what Christ has done for sinners uh, concerning His death, His burial, His resurrection, His intercession, uh, that He is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek as we find in the book of Hebrews. That He is the Lord who is to be reverenced and praised. He is the Son of Man, the King of glory. The prophets wrote about Him. The New Testament is about Him. The whole of Scripture is about Him. In fact, I love what Daniel the prophet said concerning Jesus Christ in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He said, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Christ is the King. Friends, about this time last year, well, a, a little over a year ago, in fact, there was a, a, a great amount of contention surrounding the United States presidential election. Some people were not a fan of the man who is currently in office, and some uh, were a fan. And some, I mean, obviously, he, he's in the office currently. But irregardless of that fact of whoever is president, whether they are a wicked ruler or a, a righteous ruler, Christ Jesus is the King of kings, as Revelation 19 says. He is the Lord of lords. And He is the one with whom we have to deal. He is the one concerning whom we must be diligent that we are with Him. Christ has a passion for His people, a jealousy to protect His bride. And we have to be diligent to be sure that we are part of that group, that we are part of that lot, that we are part of those for whom Christ died, that we are part of those whom Christ prayed for in John chapter 17, that we are part of those whom Christ came to save. For we know the angel told Joseph in Matthew 1, 21, he said, And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And Christ has done that, friends. I come out here with joy knowing that Christ has accomplished salvation for his people. That he has purchased redemption by his own blood. Ephesians 1, 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. A lot of times preachers talk about getting rich. God wants people to get rich. That's a lie in the pit of hell. But God is rich in grace. Rich in grace, my friends. Rich in salvation. And that is what God will make you rich in if you come to His Son. Not material wealth. Not this world. That's not what it's about. If you're living your best life now, as Joel Osteen says, it's because you're going to hell. Friends, we are to live for the life which is to come. We are to live for the next life. The life when we will stand before God and we'll be judged according to our deeds, according to what we've done, our thoughts. Where will you stand before the Holy One on that day? Friends, I offer the message of life, the good news that you can be reconciled to God. You don't have to go to hell for your sin. You don't. You don't have to perish. Christ came into the world to save sinners from perishing. And it is only through repentance and faith in the finished work of Christ. It is through relying upon the Son of God, relying upon Christ's work to justify you. There are only two religions in the world, my friends. Human accomplishment and divine accomplishment. Trusting in yourself or some man or some religious system to save you, or you're trusting upon the power of God. You're trusting upon the power that God displayed when He sent His Son into the world to save sinners. 
And friends, God is jealous for the glory and salvation, and therefore, it is all of His grace. It is all of Him that He might receive the glory for it all. And ultimately, it is my desire that as I preach the gospel this afternoon to you, that God would be glorified, would be honored and praised. As the Word is exposited, as the good news of Christ goes forth, for it is precious, precious it is indeed. The text of Scripture that I would like to explain to you this afternoon is found in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 37. The Apostle Paul is writing here about salvation. He says this, verse 37, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. And this is what I want to make known this afternoon. Salvation is by the law of faith. It is not that men might boast. It is not by works of the law that men might boast before God. But it is all of grace. It is by faith. Faith believing that God has done exactly what He said He has done in His Son. That is how salvation is brought about. The law of faith, my friends. Believing the promises of God. When we consider the good news of Christ, the gospel of grace, how is Christ's work, how is Jesus' death upon the cross, His resurrection, His intercession, His perfect life, how do we reap the benefits of that? How is that applied to us? How do we apprehend that? How do I grab hold of that? I might say. How? How? The question is, how? And the answer is faith. We know from the book of Hebrews, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith. Believing the promises of God. Believing that what Christ has said, He is able to accomplish he truly is able to accomplish that is how a man is justified and that's what I want to consider this afternoon before I do the context of Romans 3 briefly is the issue of salvation itself so this passage fits very well here Paul has already talked about the work of Christ in the previous three verses there and even in verse 22 he speaks of it but then he brings us down in verse 27. He shows us that it has to be apprehended by faith. You have to be saved by faith in the Son of God. It's not just that Jesus died. It's not just this abstract reality. How is it brought home to you? How is it applied to you? How is Christ applied to you and to me? By faith. By faith. And it is to the exclusion of boasting. Because if it is by faith, we're relying on God and not our own strength to save us. So that brings me to the beginning of verse 27 concerning the law of faith. Paul says, uh, beginning there, where then is boasting? It is excluded. Friends, no flesh will boast before the Holy One. Salvation is not 99% of Jesus, 1% of man's effort. It is all of grace. All of free grace, my friends. Why? Because God wants all the glory. He wants no man to boast. He wants no man to be prideful. He wants no man to claim that he is righteous enough to enter the kingdom. But instead, the cry of our hearts ought to be, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless come to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's what the cry of our hearts ought to be, friends. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Why? So that God receives the glory. It is excluded. 
In fact, my friends, I will go so far as to say, if you think that you can please God by your own performance, you're not fit for the kingdom. You are not fit to enter into God's kingdom. You must, my friends, humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God. He continues, by what kind of law? So we are saved by law, but what is it? The law of faith. Believing the promises of God. Believing that Christ kept the work, kept the law for us. That is where true salvation is found. In fact, you could say we are saved by works, just not the works of our own. Not the works of our own doing, but Christ's work. But Jesus' finished work. He says, by what kind of law? Of works? So he asks the question, then he answers it. No, but by a law of faith. The Greek word pistuo, pistis, both translated either belief or faith in the New Testament. Both are derived from a Greek word that means to persuade. Persuade. Has God persuaded you? Has the Spirit of God persuaded you concerning the beauty of Jesus Christ? concerning the power of Christ and have you come unto Him for life. That's the nature of saving faith. That's the root of the Greek word to be persuaded. It is a divine persuasion wrought by God in the heart of man whereby we are persuaded that Jesus Christ is able to save us to the uttermost and thereby we come to Him. Faith does not simply say, I know that Jesus saves. No, my friends. Faith says, I know that Jesus Christ saves and I flee to Him. I run to Him. I bow the knee to Him and say, my Lord, my God, as Thomas did in John 20, 28. That is what faith says. That is the nature of saving faith. There is a faith that will damn. There is a faith that will not save and it is a faith in oneself. A faith in a religious system. A faith in a, in a religious leader to save or to justify man. A faith in one's own religious performance. A faith in a false god. Such faiths do not save, they are not faith indeed. They are pseudo-faith. False faith. Another form of false faith is believing that God just wants your health, wealth, and prosperity in this life. That's a false faith. The true nature of saving faith is the object of it. See, faith doesn't save anybody. Faith doesn't save a soul. Faith never brought a soul to heaven. Christ brought souls to heaven. Christ will bring souls to heaven. Jesus is the object of faith. Your faith cannot save you. And if your trust is in your faith, you're lost. The object of your faith saves only is it if it is Christ. There is such an exclusivity. Jesus said in Matthew 7, the way is narrow and the gate is small that leads to life. And oh, how true that is. How true it is that the way to life is narrow. It is a narrow way, my friends. Violent men take the kingdom of God by force. Friends, I plead with you. Take hold of the kingdom of God with violence, with desperation. Press yourself into the kingdom. Repent and believe upon Christ. Flee your sin. It's not worth it. Sin is pleasurable only for a season, only for a limited time. And then, and then it will make you lost forever. Friends, God is so holy. I cannot express to you using words how holy God is, how righteous, how pure, how just God is. In fact, we find in Isaiah 6 that Isaiah sees the angels there in heaven around the throne of God and they are crying out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. He is merciful and compassionate. He is abounding in loving kindness. That is true. It is true. God in His holiness gave His law. 
You need to understand something about the nature of God's law. It's that you've broken it. You've broken it. It's that it cannot be kept by sinful men. For God has said in His holiness, you shall not lie, you shall not blaspheme or steal, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not worship a false god. But what do you do, friends? You sin. What have you done? You've sinned. What have we all done? We have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And let us not think that we can present to God good works to justify us. What does Isaiah 64, 6 say? For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Filthy garment? God sees our righteous deeds as a filthy garment? Absolutely. In fact, the Hebrew word or the Hebrew words, it a baged, means a used minstrel rag. That's how God sees our good works, my friends, as repulsive to the uttermost. So we are without hope, intrinsic hope, that is, hope in ourselves, hope in our performance. But God is the God of hope. God being rich in mercy because of His great love, with which He loved us, with which He loved His people. He chose them from the foundation of the world to be saved in His Son, to be redeemed. He commissioned Christ before the world was made to come and to die for the elect whom He chose. In fact, we find Jesus speaking about this in John 10. John 10 Verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Incredible, my friends. Glorious is this reality. The Father gave us. He gave His people to His Son before the world was made. Think about that. God knew your life of sin that you would live if you're His. And yet He ordained that His Son would die for you and for me out of grace. That is the rich mercy of God. That is the love that God has manifested toward His people. And so when the right time came, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. I do not exempt myself out of this lot of miserable wretches. I am in the midst of them. I am the greatest of them. But Jesus came to save me. He fulfilled the law on behalf of His church. We know that from Matthew 5. He said, I did not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And He did. Then He died as the Lamb of God upon the cross, taking upon Himself the sins of God's people. He became a curse for them. He bore the wrath of the Father against the sins of the elect. Galatians 3.10 says, or, I'm sorry, Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ became a curse for His people, bearing the infinite wrath of the Father. Three days later, He was raised from the dead. The Father vindicated Him. He cleared His name. He rose Him up. Christ is alive today and forevermore. Forty days later, He went into heaven. He ascended bodily into glory and He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. That is glorious. Glorious indeed.
Friends, Christ has accomplished redemption for His people. And the call from the mouth of the Lord Jesus Himself, the command is what? Well, Matt, Mark 1 tells us, Mark 1, 15. Jesus here is speaking. He says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That is the call. That's the command to repent and to believe the gospel. To turn from your sin, to flee your rebellion, and to come to the Son of God for eternal life. And for all who do so, as we know from Luke 24, their sins are forgiven. They receive forgiveness of sin on account of the work of Christ. That is, the Father considers them as if they lived Jesus' life. He wraps them in the righteousness of His Son. He regards them as righteous. All by grace. All by grace. And for those who are truly saved, their lives reflect that reality. They live for Christ. They delight in holiness. They delight in the Word of God, in prayer, in the means of grace. They are made new. They bear fruit of that. They don't continue on as they were before, just living however they want. They're new creations. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. The old is done away with, and new things have come. Repentance and faith are not things that you can conjure up within yourself. They are evangelical graces. They are graces from God Himself. They are granted to the sinner by God Himself. Examine yourself to see whether you know Christ, to see whether you live for Christ. If you do not, repent and believe. If so, rest. Rest, continue to rest in the gospel, brethren. Preach it, proclaim it, publish it, share it with those who are lost and who need salvation. It is all by grace, all by unmerited favor. Ultimately, it is that God might receive the glory. It's, it's, it is ordered that way that God might be praised in it, that God might receive all the honor in the economy of salvation. As we know from the book of Revelation. Thank you. As we know from the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 4, the heavenly hosts are praising God, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, and our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. God is worthy to receive all glory, honor, and power, praise, and adoration forever. To the triune God be all glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, please, you say you know Christ. You say that you're a Christian. But look at your life. Look at the way you think and talk. Do you truly know Christ? Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Do you love the Word of God in prayer and holiness? If not, you're not Christ's. It's not that you justify yourself by your work, but your work proves that you've been saved. It's evidential. It shows the evidence. It is the evidence of you having been saved. And if it's not there, you haven't been converted. So repent and believe if you're lost. But if you look at your life and you say, God has done a work in me then praise God. Go share the gospel. Don't, don't stand around idly. Preach Christ and Him crucified. To the Jews, the stumbling blocks. To the Greeks, foolishness.
you who are lost, please come to Christ. Jesus said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Christ bids men to come and to have life eternally. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3 in verse 27 that boasting in salvation is excluded. It is all by the law of faith, by faith in the promises of God. We have sinned, we deserve hell, yes, but Christ came to save sinners. And all who believe on Him are saved from sin, all by His grace, all to His glory. So to the Father, to the Son, to the Spirit, the one true God, be all glory and honor and praise forevermore. Amen and amen.